first scripture reading today comes from Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. This is the season of Mark, the year of Mark, so we'll be studying Mark this year. And this is how Mark begins his gospel. The beginning of the good news was about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about the prophecy of Isaiah. So he's saying, if you want to know how this was going to happen, just read Isaiah, because that's exactly how it happened. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, one stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Our second scripture comes from 2 Peter 3, 8 through 15a. Don't let it escape your notice, dear friends, that with the Lord a single day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord isn't slow to keep his promise, as some think of slowness. But he is patient towards you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to change their hearts and lives. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and on that day the heavens will pass away with a dreadful noise, and the elements will be consumed by fire, and the earth and all the works done on it will be exposed. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? You must live holy and godly lives, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God. Because of that day, the heavens will be destroyed by fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. But according to this promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be bound by him in peace, pure and faultless. Consider the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as our dear friend and brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. It's Christmas time. And a very common tradition for many of us is to watch a Christmas movie. Uh, does anybody have a favorite Christmas movie they would like to share? What's oh, oh sorry, Sue Ellen. Sure. But well, last night I watched again Home Alone. Home Alone. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Sue Ellen. White Christmas. White Christmas. It's a wonderful. One. It's a Wonderful Life. Miracle on 34th Street. Miracle on 34th Street. <laughs> Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn. Long Christmas Vacation. A Christmas Vacation. <laughs> we watched last night. Nice. Love Actually. Love Actually. Nice. A Christmas Project. A Christmas Project. That's our sermon today is a Christmas Project, huh? Those are all great movies. I think that it is fun to remember when we got it right, right? And in any good Christmas movie, things begin to go wrong. Like Home Alone, right? Yep. Just, the, just a little things go wrong and they get worse. <laughs> then it goes good. There is this thing. And for the scriptures today, the Israelites, and for Dr. Seuss, and I dare say our own era, things are going wrong. How do we get it right? When can we get the message just right? And usually, just usually, it requires learning something, a bending, a moving, learning something about your enemy, learning about, I don't know, now you got me thinking about Home Alone, so <laughs> learning that you don't have to get your pizza. <laughs> that was 
one of the things that triggered the trauma. Um, it requires a change. Our family, my favorite Christmas movie is A Christmas Project. Do any of you know that one? It's from 2006. My generation loved it, but I'm in the middle between you guys. Okay, well, The Christmas Project is about a home with four boys. And in the home, there's four boys and one pregnant mom, and she really wants a girl. So she's always wearing pink, and she's always drinking pink milk. <laughs> She's really wanting a girl this round. But they have four boys and they share a bedroom. And it's based off the stories um, of the authors. It was a play and everything. Um, and these four brothers, the Barclay brothers, uh, they have fun, they have a pirate ship, they have imagination, they have all the good things childhood should have. But they also have one thing that all children will probably experience, whether we like it or not, they have bullies. Right? And the bullies are in the neighborhood. And it's a rough and tumble kind of bully group. There is some fist fighting at school. And there is some drama. And there's some stealing of things and some pranks being pulled. And let's just say the Barkley brothers and the bullies don't get along. The family, though, has a Christmas tradition. They call it Elfie. And what they do is a few nights of the year, in the Christmas season, leading up to Christmas, they leave presents for somebody. And this year, wouldn't you know, their mother picks the bullies. They're going to have to give treats to the bullies. They're going to have to give presents to the bullies. And in their elfin tradition, they always have one kid drop it, ring the doorbell and run, and then the other kids kind of hide and see their facial reactions of the present. And they were mad and they're like, Mom, are you kidding me? I still have a bloody nose and you're going to make me leave your good cookies on their front porch step. And they do. And they notice that night that a little girl comes out and is grateful. And as the time goes on, the Barclays think, well, maybe the youngest of their family is okay. I mean, the older ones who are fighting, there's no hope. But maybe the younger siblings are okay. Then another night, they bring a really decorated, fancy gingerbread house, and they notice the brother gets it, and the little girl goes, what's for dinner tonight? And he goes, well, you just got it, a gingerbread house. And at that point in time, things in their head begin clicking, and they realize there's never a parent home when they need one. And then the Barclays, they do this kind of odd thing. Um, they go to that same family that sets up a Christmas tree lot with the most raggedy trees they drug off their land to get some extra money. And the mom insists that they go to the tree farm there. And the tree doesn't look as great as they've always had. And of course, there's another scuffle that begins. And during this time, their sled goes missing that has just been painted blue, and of course, the bullies stole their new sled. It wasn't quick, it wasn't fast, it was a typical movie in the sense that they got from bad to worst. One particular prank in the movie is the bullies would steal cookies from the kids that they were planning to give their teacher or a gift, and they got tired of getting their cookies stolen. So he made cookies with toothpaste <laughs> and got the other bully in trouble. But the prank didn't leave him feeling happy inside. He felt quite sad. He was quite a surprise that bullying the bully didn't feel the way he thought it would. I think that that sentiment, that feeling he gets, is what every chaplain will talk about from any war. Whether you win the war or not, whether soldiers win the war or not, nobody really feels like a winner. They saw and went through things that were horrific. I know of wonderful people that went off to wars and they don't feel good about it. So the story goes on and it's the last Christmas night and they're still bullying, it's not getting any better, it's escalating, but it's Christmas Eve, 
and they've grown to appreciate the fondness of the older brother trying to take care of the younger brother. And they begin to recognize that the older brother fights and gets in these arguments because he's a child trying to protect his siblings, and he doesn't know any better. And they look around and they recognize their home is big with food and more cookies at home. And eventually they stop looking for the Christmas catalog because that's not what really matters. On Christmas Eve, they leave a present for each one of them, including a new sled. And then the movie ends, and you would think that there would be this, oh, great, they're playing together, and it's a happy ending, but no, they're going to go live with their grandma. But the main bully, the oldest of the boy, gives back the other sled to the friend and says, I don't need this piece of junk anymore. I have a new one. <laughs> And it's a semi-truce. It's not a perfect truce. It's not like we'll be friends and hang out together. It's a here you go kind of truce. I appreciate this Christmas story because it doesn't have that hallmark ending. It doesn't have that kumbaya with everybody holding hands and skipping off to, you know, the bakery. It's an honest truth. It's a struggle. It's a learning about your enemy. It's doing something kind to your enemy. And the ending isn't perfect. It's a little messy. But both sides are trying. And I like this with my boys because throughout the Christmas Projects movie, I asked them, do you think those bullies' hearts would be changed if somebody if nobody did anything nice to them, oh, they would keep going down that path of being a bully. Keep going down Christmas feeling less and less hopeful, seeing kids with presents and toys. The poor kids would have a less chance of changing their hearts. And the rich kids, or the kind of you know middle class kids, their hearts would still be self-centered, right? In many ways, both the bullies and the middle class kids need each other. Their spirit yearns for one another. And the truth you come up to is a messy truth. And when I think about peace, whether it be in Ukraine, or peace in the Holy Lands, or peace around the world, or any of the tribes or continents, it's going to be messy. And it's going to be unnerving, right? You don't know if it's peace yet. I'm not sure that our culture today has any more skills of peace than we did 100 years ago, or 100 years before that, or 100 more. I do have hope in what Jesus taught us, is to be nice anyway. When John the Baptist was out in the desert and he begins his call to his people to change their ways, the funny thing to think about is John the Baptist's father worked at the temple. He would have been one that would have been cradled up to leading the church. He would have been like a Methodist pastor whose family had been Methodist pastors and here's the church and here's the pulpit. Go on, John, speak to the people. And he says, no, I'm going to the wilderness. So those who show up, we're not looking for a political gain or a concert even. Those who showed up in the desert had to struggle on their journey. They would probably be dirty. They would set aside all of the trauma and all of what has happened in the past few years underneath all the dictators. And they would come and say, what must I do to prepare the way? And what does John say to the tax collector? Do you remember what he says? Don't collect more than you have to. Do your job, and that's it. Don't be greedy. Don't lie. We know you have to pay your bills. So there'll be people who know they have to pay their bills, but just don't be greedy. Be kind in what you do. Go a different road. Walk away from the lights and the sounds. Peace Sunday is oftentimes to me felt like 
a Christmas checklist growing up in the church. In the midst of buying cards and presents and baking and decorating, you come to church and your pastor says, remember, check peace off your list. But it doesn't work like that. Peace is a journey and it takes time. And you're going to find yourself in strange places with strange people. And when you look for that answer on how to move forward with peace, you're not going to get an easy answer. No. You're still going to have to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. It's going to be complicated. When I think about peace in the Holy Land, I don't think peace will come because one group has taken out the other group. When I think of peace in the Holy Lands, there was this big debate that after the first siege and after so many lives were lost and hurt and, and beaten in ways, people were kind of shocked. If you'll notice on the front of your bulletin, it's women from the Women Wage Peace Movement on October 4th, 2023. And they had a big event at that time, right before. And they had speakers from around the world. There are women who are Israel, women who live in, who, are, who live under Hamas. There were women that come together, mothers that are tired of having children that go off to war or have to learn to hate. Women that are tired of bearing the burden of war. I chose this picture because I think it's important to look at each and every one of those women and remember that there is not one of them that has not been affected. Their lives changed in the last few months. They carried a banner for peace. They are going to need everyone on board. They need to be remembered. It's not clear that all those women have survived in the last few months. But we remember. And we know our job. And we light a candle for peace. We may not see it right away. Just like in 2 Peter, folks were like, hey, where's that second coming of Jesus? And we have to have a whole talk about the difference of time to, a, I don't know, your God and your child. <laughs> a child in the back seat saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? We need to not be that child. We hold on and we light the candle for peace each and every year because peace matters. Because peace was one of the major things that Jesus brought this world. And we have a choice to make. We can be people of peace and we can make little decisions and we can take that long, hard road. Or we can just become hopeless and say it'll never happen and walk away and not do anything, become complacent. That's a choice, you're given it. But as a Christian, we are called to peace. And even if those that we stand side by side with as we march fall, are mourning their dead, we remember. But more than that, we believe it will happen. We believe that Jesus will make this happen, and that it is still our responsibility to do what we can with what we have. There's, there's no middle of the road. You are either for peace or you are against it. Complacency will not get us to where we need to be. And it can be hard waiting. It can be hard believing in a God that takes a couple hundred years to getting around. Isaiah 40, when we are referenced in Mark, says to go back to Isaiah and read the coming. And these are people that have lost their way, their country is falling, and they have nothing. And yet, this prophecy was given. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak compassionately to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her that her compulsory service has ended that her penalty has been paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is crying out, clear the Lord's way in the desert and make a level highway in the wilderness for our God. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain and hill will be flattened. Uneven ground will become level and rough terrain a valley plain. 
The Lord's glory will appear and all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it and a voice was crying out, call out. And another said, what should I call out? All flesh is grass, all its loyalty is like the flowers of the field. The grass dries up and the flower withers. When the Lord's breath blows on it, surely the people are grass, and the grass dies up, and the flower withers. But our God's word will exist forever. Go up on a high mountain, messenger Zion. Raise your voice and shout, messenger Jerusalem. Raise it and don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God, here is your Lord God, coming with strength, with a triumphant arm, bringing his reward with him and his payment before him. Like a shepherd, God will tend the flock, and he will gather the lambs in his arms and lift them onto his lap, and he will gently guide the nursing ewes. It was a beautiful piece written a long time ago. They waited a long time for Jesus. I think Jesus is waiting a very long time for us to get the peace right. The difference between a Christian talking about peace and somebody else of not that sort of foundation is that we know peace is coming. We have faith that peace is coming. And because we know that faith, through our faith, that peace is coming, we will work for that peace. We will not become despondent. We will not forget the women on the cover of our bulletin. And we will not fall to war. We will pick it up and we will continue the work that Jesus started many years ago. That was prophesied in Isaiah many years before that. So don't walk out of this church today thinking, oh, I hope someday there's peace. No, there will be peace. The question is whether or not you will help bring that peace or not. Amen? Amen. <laughs>